Hello. Hello, Carol. Welcome to the How show. Are How are you? Oh, sit Very down. Good. Good. This Thanks is, for coming. This is Jim Norton. I'm Sam Roberts, and that is Rich Voss. He put his hat on for you. I like that. Yeah. Thank you. I have to say, I, I thought about stealing it, but now that we've been introduced, I guess I, can, I, guess I can Anything I own can be sold. <laughs> oh, I didn't say bought. I said steal. I know. I'm just saying that I, you know we can right, meet well, in the I'm middle. Just saying. <laughs> now, do you really like his hat, or are you just being polite? No, I love the hat. Do you like men in hats, or only certain faces for a hat? Well, I also wonder if do you like the hat, or do you like him wearing the hat? Like you could like the hat as the, its own. The thing looks good. The picture looks good. It fits Man, my if face. I, say. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You don't think he looks a little silly in a white hat? No, it's a summer. A little. Like, it's not exactly a resort town, you know? Well, it's I, a summer chapeau. And here, here's, <laughs> I have seven of these hats. I picked the white one today. Do you have all different colors? Yeah, Seriously? yeah, Where yeah. do they come from? Uh, a hat company. Called uh, what? Oh, Bailey. Susquehanna Bailey. Hat Company. Bailey. 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 Like do you ever hear Bailey? No. No, no. no. those hats. It's cheap. It's I a want, cheap hat. It's a $70 hat. $70. It's not cheap. It's already going down. $70 hat, $60. It's I about $40. No, it's a $30 hat. No, it's... These are, cheap. It's cheap hats. Are you out of your crazy mind? Not, Look them up online. They're not... They're not good hats. We don't Carol, you'll be advised. It's not a good a hat. Huge. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, if you have seven of the same hat, odds are you got a deal on no, them, right? No, I buy them at different times. I got winter. I got different colors to match different clothing. Yeah. You know? It's okay. Silly, right? It's It's a little silly. No, why? Uh, it, then it, you don't have to panic that you're going to lose your hat. You have six, <laughs> six as a backup. That's yeah. true. <laughs> you have six, six backups. Have, yeah. These are my six backup hats. How many yeah. pairs of sneakers you have, Sam? I, I collect sneakers. I collect hats. <laughs> you do well, you not. collect sneakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very See, cool. These are my sneakers today. And, and Tomorrow will be something socks? different. Yeah, yeah, I got yeah. colorful socks on. I, I shouldn't mention that they don't exactly match or anything. No, yeah. my sneakers and socks do not um, do, look at this outfit match don't. today. You see that how that matches the blue in the hat. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> do you like his blue childish sneakers? <laughs> <laughs> you don't like them, do you? You know what's um, ironic about those tonight. sneakers? He'll be sixty next week. <laughs> yeah. I don't love the the whole very colorful sneaker look. Right? Yeah, it's cheesy, right? I like me a nice white or black pair of sneakers. Or a smart shoe? Uh, smart vegetarian Doc Martens. I see. Do you like Doc Martens? I enjoy Doc Martens. I'm wearing my vegetarian Doc Martens right now. What are vegetarian oh, Doc Martens? They're they, not made. They are not made from animals. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, that's what you did. Vegetarian, vegetarian, that's what that means. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. But I mean, is there a brand of docs that are called vegetarians, or are they all uh, vegetarian? Uh, no, they're not all vegetarian. Oh. But I'll tell you the big plus of the vegetarian, besides the fact that nobody died to be on your shoe is that they're very light compared to leather. Oh, okay. Maybe I will look at, look them up because I have very fat feet, Carol. I mean, Uncomfortable. They're Doc, Martins. <laughs> they're Doc Martins, but they are the vegetarian version. But they can be a little heavy, Doc Martins. Well, not these ones. I just... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. Please, are please. Are you not paying attention? No, I don't want to start a thing. Believe me, I'll, I'll look it up. I'll, I'll look at it for a pair. Well, the, we've already had two things in the three minutes that I've been That is true. Share. Yeah. Two that is true. Two, two misunderstandings. <laughs> Rich and I are fighting. You and Carol are fighting. Things are not good here. Things are not good. <laughs> There's so much to talk to you about. I, I would love to ask, of course, well, you're in one of my favorite, you're in my favorite sitcom of all time, and you're in my one of my favorite films of all time, Dog Day Afternoon. Oh, yeah, that's a great movie. I want to talk about that. Uh, so you, you guys, I mean, you got like, very few people got to work with John Cazale. Well, I am so lucky because I got to work with John a lot. I Because I was also working with him um, in a play called Dog Day After, not not that play <laughs> called, called uh, The Resistible Rise of Arturo Uy with Al Pacino, and John and Al worked together a lot. So then we got to do this play at the Public Theater and in Boston, and so um, he was uh, a dear and incredible friend. And as we all know, he's a genius. He's a genius. Yeah, and and, and uh, you stayed in touch with him after you did that film, or no? Always. And uh, you found out he got sick. How long did you know he was sick for before he passed away? Uh, a while. A, a while? Year, a year, maybe. Yeah, because they said that they, it was amazing, the documentary, that they, they, they did the deer hunter. Yeah. They shot in a certain order. 
because they knew that he was not well, which I thought was pretty amazing that everybody knew and they still got the the film done. Well, that's true. What was it that made him, you know, brilliant? Like, what was the if there's a quality that you could isolate that, yeah, that, that separated can. him from well, from other actors? He just was um, incapable of doing a second of dishonest work. He just was hundred percent there all the time. Never, in fact, I something that was so brave that he did is when when you do a movie or a play, you generally do a reading of it first. You sure. read the whole script out loud, and it's almost impossible not to try and be the best kid in the class at the reading. You know, you you're trying to you you want everybody to go up to you at the end and say, "Oh my God, you were really good." Yeah. Right? So, John as I said, incapable of being dishonest ever, just would sit there and just not act. He just wouldn't put, if something wasn't there for him, he wouldn't fake it. He wouldn't push anything. And that is really scary to do because people are really trying to get a lot of approval at those readings. It's just the human thing to do but John would be he was so pure as an artist he was so pure and so it um, wasn't about approval for, for John? him he didn't have that actor I think quality. it was about discovering what was there and being honest and discovering what what was what the character so he would just read it through plain like just like read it like you're reading a book out loud not try well, to be he wasn't like going out of his way to bore people yeah, or yeah. anything like that he just was in other words okay so you're reading you're doing a reading and say 70 percent of it you're feeling in touch with the words and what's happening in the scene etc or say 50 percent or whatever then most of us will push the part that we're not sure of. We will try and live up to what we think the director and the writer are hoping to get a, a, as an end result. You know, I mean, I try not to do that, but like I say, it's almost impossible. You do want right. to get some praise, you know. So we we push the stuff that we're not able to get to sometimes. Uh, say if you had to cry or laugh or whatever, and you, or just or yell or whatever, and John just wouldn't push anything. If if it was there for him, it would be there, and if it wasn't, that wouldn't be like the high point of the reading, you know. But actually, it kind of was the high point for me because you just never meet an actor that's quite that honest, you know. Yeah. yeah. Do actors, like, say, we talked about this with comics. Uh -huh. You know, say a bunch of actors were sitting out, hanging out, having dinner, discussing <laughs> good actors, you know, what they, who they consider a yeah. good actor. Yeah. Would you put more emphasis on what actors think of other actors or fans think of actors? Well, I, I don't, I don't think it's an either or. Right, I mean, that's, that's what I said to Dumb Jim. question. What? <laughs> no, we discussed this with comics. He's, uh, Carol, can I tell you what just happened? What? Because it's a bizarre question. That you it is a bizarre ask. question. Like, and, and, really and you look stunned sense. that somebody would ask such a dumb question. Yes, she hates you for it. The, it's reason, okay. the reason he asked you that question. I said it. Is this another thing already? <laughs> <laughs> yes, number three. Because <laughs> Jim and I were both annoyed that he asked you that question. <laughs> yeah. Because he only asked you that question because... hoping that you would agree with what he said two hours ago oh, so I that then it. he could he could go see i told you i tried to tell you guys yeah which is like that's not why you're and here. is that what happened it's I, selfish I, I, is it what yeah. you just did is selfish yeah. oh, very I'm selfish sorry. i'm sorry yes, yes. <laughs> i made a tenth step. you'll have I'm to sorry. give me the hat for that selfishness <laughs> why don't you give her the hat no give don't the give, hat. Me, the, give, don't the give hat. me that the guy needs his i'll hat. give you a hundred bucks if you take his hat off and step on it right now give me a hundred bucks give me a hundred bucks and i'll step on it is it is it difficult, right? So after you have that experience, yeah. does it become more difficult for you to work with actors that maybe not are that great? Of course. Because like, you can see, like, you can be that good. Why are you not striving to be this? Well, it's not a que I don't think it's a question of striving. You know, it's a sensibility and sensitivity, empathy, uh, and, uh, you know, it's... It's in your heart and mind, you know, and so 
if you've had good teachers, hopefully they will help you get toward that state. But if you don't have... You know, not everybody has John Cazale's incredible heart and mind, you know, right. no matter how much they strive. So actually, it'd be almost the opposite. You can't really strive to be that great. Right. Wait, is it trying Cazale? to be I that be... honest, like, you can't, tr- you have to just be, right? Well, you have to remind yourself to, to just try and stay, like they say, which is, I'm just repeating a cliche, in the moment, right? Mm-hmm. So not to be reaching ahead or... Yeah. Is his name Kazali? I've been saying Kazale for 40 years. Some people say Kazale. Some people say Kazale. Okay, so I'm not a complete fool. And you were also in Taxi. Uh, and you, you had to work a lot with Andy Kaufman, who uh, I never met. So what was he like to work with? Because you hear very mixed stories. Some people loved working with him, and some people didn't like working with him. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Um, I loved working with him, even though we had a completely different um, approach to the work. Because... I come from the theater, and in the theater, rehearsal is everything, right? You just rehearse until you drop dead, practically, and then then it's probably not enough anyway. And Andy, you know, used to explain to me that that was bad for his process. Rehearsing was no good for him because he, um, you know, was a performance artist. I guess people call him stand-up or comedian, but he was definitely a performance artist, and he did not like to be set in anything. He liked to be spontaneous. And um, so <laughs> we had this a discussion every week that we worked together because they had a fake Andy for four, three and a half of the five days of the rehearsal week. They had a fake Andy that oh, 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 had poor guy, his name was Jeff, and he had to go around with a car, piece of cardboard on a string around his neck and said Andy. And <laughs> he, he would be, you know, he would block the scenes with you and do the, And then Andy would come in the day of the performance, and I would be mad yeah. because I didn't get to rehearse with my real Andy. And Andy would be apologetic, but explain to me how he couldn't. It, it, he just couldn't. And he had it in his contract, and I was the latecomer, you know. But um, he couldn't do that, and I, I was nervous about not working with him enough. And then we would have this discussion, and we would be honest with each other. And by the time we finished our discussion every week, we would be together. You know, we would we would have a closeness because we had just come from this sort of a married couple's kind of discussion. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't being difficult. He really was that way. Oh, no, he wasn't being difficult. It was in his contract. He felt that that's the way he worked the best. I don't know if that's true of most people in comedy or whatever, but that was true for him, and, and he he was protected. Pr- pr- protecting him his his work method did that frustrate the other cast members that like he didn't have to work full weeks while everybody else did like that he got special treatment i don't really know how they felt about it we didn't really discuss that because every every like portrayal i feel like every behind the scenes portrayal of taxi uh it feels like there's a lot of hostility towards andy Is that from right? the rest of the cast yeah that's what i well, feel where like do that's... you see that I, in all the sort of uh, uh, documentaries that come out, I feel like uh, in the move in the Man on the Moon movie, it seemed like you know most of the cast was fed up with with Andy's antics and the Tony Clifton stuff. And I think it was difficult in the sense that because he was such a brilliant performance artist, you sort of never knew where you were, and that that was a little difficult for people, such as when he did the Jerry Lawler thing and he, you know, hurt his neck and he went to the hospital and then when he came back to work he was wearing the brace and everything and Even though he didn't <laughs> And then Danny Danny slowed down the the film and and uh, figured out that he you know, the thing was very pliable and that it was all probably a setup. He was working you guys? He was working well, he was working he was working. Let's yeah. just say that. He was yeah. working. Yeah. And um, and uh, pe- we had sent him flowers and magazines and <laughs> the food and all that stuff. And so then I think maybe some people felt a little annoyed that we 
didn't get special. That's that's what we didn't get. We didn't get special treatment. He didn't let you know. No. He's like, I'm okay. Everything's good. Mm-mm. But you can, I mean, you can't see because you don't know him. But that is critical. Was critical to who he was as an artist. He never ever winked at anybody. He never, you know, he he never said yeah but not really he never said that he just put it out there and it was up to you if you believed him or didn't believe him and there was no compromising on his part what was the first when was the first time you had to meet deal with tony clifton oh um <laughs> i you know i i didn't w- really work with tony clifton did i uh, does anybody remember my life cuz i don't <laughs> <laughs> um i'm not sure if i I must have a little bit, but I was not, for instance, I was not there when Tony Clifton got fired for for, for, for one thing, and this was a big uh, scandal at the show that 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 he actually got himself fired. He was, um, he came in with hookers and alcohol and <laughs> smoking, and, and uh, he wouldn't, he was late all the time. Andy, by the way, was not late. Right. He was very responsible. His work ethic was strong. It was just specific, you know. Right. But Tony, Tony didn't have, the didn't same have the, quite the same work ethic. <laughs> and he just made it so hard on everybody that they, the producers fired him. They fired Andy or they said, no more Tony? No more Tony. They fired Tony. So funny. Yeah, Tony got thrown off the lot. Yeah, Tony got thrown off the lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy and, to commit to it so strongly, too. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah, it's really... Yes, I mean he he had so many uh, secrets, you know, and uh, and and that that's the key. What you just said, he committed to everything, hundred percent. What was it like to revisit the like taxi set and everything when when you guys did Man on the Moon? Because they brought the, most of the cast right. back in. It was very uh, emotional and peculiar, because the set was our. It was like exactly our set, and of course Danny was one of the producers of the movie as well as playing uh, George, his man- Andy's manager. And um, so he knew. He got it right. Right. You know? And Milos, of course, wants things true and right. So it was very emotional. It was very weird. And then seeing, uh, you know, Jim be sort of Jim, but, Sort of Andy and sort of Tony, and it was very confusing. Actually, yeah. How how was Jim as Jim Carrey as lovely. Andy? Yeah. Yeah, I thought he was lovely. But how about as Andy Kaufman? What did you think his performance? Yeah, I, oh. I thought I thought it was lovely. I I um I maybe the one thing I thought could have been there a little more, and it's not a performance thing, is that um Andy just had this sweetness to him. That was just unbelievable. And I don't think they, of course, sweetness does not a a movie make, you know. So I think they, you know, got more involved with some of the more bizarre things. And, uh, yeah. And you were in When a Stranger Calls? I certainly was. Somebody's calling about that on the phone. Um, Don't answer it is what I have to say. (laughs) (laughs) Joe, what did you want to say? He wanted to say something to Carol. Hello, Joe in Wisconsin. Have you checked the children? I knew that's what you were going to say. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, really I didn't told notice. you not to. Thank you, Joe. She did warn you. Thank you, Joe. That is one of the more <laughs> iconic and horrifying <laughs> things in a film ever. Yeah. Horrible. Oh, that was Horrible. really. Did you, when, you, when you're filming something, it's probably hard to, to understand how terrifying it is until you finally see it removed, or were you able to tell when you were doing it? Um... I read it, so I was terrified when I read it. You are. Um, it's not as terrifying when you're shooting because you have a hundred people around you. But I got a sense of the suspense of it, the way it was shot. You know, like long, slow shot of from the feet up to my face for how you take the children by the time. You get to the face or something, you're ready to scream even though nothing's happened. You know, it was that pace of of the suspenseful pace of shooting too. And and, and then when they told you the calls coming from in the house, yeah, that it's just a terrifying oh It's awful. And <laughs> and you know, they say that it, it came from 
you know, there's folklore that things like that have happened when, to babysitters. I don't know if that's true or not true, but I sure wouldn't want to be a babysitter after seeing that movie. No, wait, have, sorry. Have, no, go ahead. Who was the shadow of the door? Do you remember who they used to play the shadow of the guy who opened the door? <laughs> there was no. a guy, a shadow of the door I opening. Know. I don't know. Oh, you don't know? Okay, it was probably just some producer or PA. I beg your damn pardon. I don't recall. <laughs> Do you have any idea when when the movies you're working on are going to last forever? Like, I feel like, specifically, The Princess Bride and Scrooged yeah. are movies that, like, people see them when they were a kid and just carry them with them forever. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing. Well, well the, the two things that they have in common, actually, is that whole fairy tale aspect. And I must say, when you're shooting a movie that's a fairy tale, it's so it's so special because the art director and everybody have, and the costume designers and everyone are all working toward a sort of a hyper real or surreal atmosphere and like the set of Scrooge was so beautiful with the snow and the little buildings that were the Christmas village and all that stuff and then um on Princess Bride my god you know the little hut and we, we had to wear uh contact lenses that you couldn't really see through very well and the smoke and the costumes and so you are you are feeling that you're in a fairy tale which is for me I love that feeling I don't think I thought well this will last forever because you just never know when something's cut together what it what it right be. but it's right. true but they fe- those two movies felt very special in the process did you meet Andre the Giant I got to fly I mean that is special in and of itself yeah oh of course I met Andre and how was Andre? Uh, another of the sweetest people on the earth. Just gent, uh, as they say, gentle giant, very there sweet, sweet guy. Legendary stories about how much he liked to drink. Well, there are some of those stories. <laughs> I, I was not, uh, I did not find him in the lobby of the hotel on the floor, which somebody did, I guess. Oh. Um, and oh. Was it on that shoot of that movie that they found him in the lobby on the floor? I think uh, something like that. I mean, I've only read that. Same as he liked to enjoy a cocktail, Andre. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard he would put a few beers back. He would, yeah. Well, just like a hundred. But he was so big. I mean, he was big. Those beers would go down fast. I'm sure of that. Yeah, he was a very big boy. I mean, hopefully, you'd have to follow him in the bathroom. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's not good. That's not good. Yeah, you don't want to see Andre coming out of the porta potty. 